Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings and welcome to GSA. We've got an action-packed schedule this morning, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Tammy White, and I work on the challenge.gov program, and I want to extend a hearty welcome to all of you for coming. Despite scheduling changes, I'm glad to see so many in attendance. This is our first meeting of the Federal Challenges and Prize uh, Community of Practice of 2018. We are delighted to welcome so many of you back and to see so many newcomers in the audience. Uh, and we know that there are a uh, few folks online too. So welcome. Um, how many of you, uh, for how many of you is this your first time attending a community of practice meeting? Wow, great. So welcome. Make sure that uh, you sign up for our listserv before you leave. I'll be seeking you out. Um, so just a couple of logistics really quickly. Uh, I want to point out the closest restroom for you all. Um, it's gonna be down the hall and to the right. Um, uh, also, um, exits from the building, the closest exit from the building is gonna be down this hall and to the left, down the steps, or out through the main security um, gate uh, where you came in, where many of you came in. Uh, there is Wi-Fi. Uh, the, uh, Wi-Fi ID is GSA guest and the password is on the back whiteboard if any of you all need online access. And with that, I'm gonna ask you to power down your mobile devices and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Kelly Olson is the director of the innovation portfolio um, in the technology transformation services here at GSA. In this role, she serves as an advisor, strategist, and force multiplier for open innovation methods. Um, she wears the dual hat of program director for challenge.gov and citizenscience.gov as well. So please welcome Kelly. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to see so many new faces here. Thanks for joining us. Um, it is my honor to welcome Matt Lira. He is the Senior Advisor to the President for Innovation Policy and Initiatives. Um, he is at the White House Office of American Innovation. Uh, for the past, past decade, Matt's work has placed him at the cross-section of politics, government, and the emerging digital economy. With a unique mixture of experiences in congressional leadership and national campaigns, he has gained firsthand insight into our nation's political and governing institutions. He has served as senior advisor to House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, digital director for 2012 Vice Presidential nominee Paul Ryan, and policy advisor to House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Throughout his work in government, Matt has aimed to forge trust and consensus by bringing people together to find areas where progress can be made. Welcome, Matt. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, thanks for the great introduction. It's a real pr uh, privilege to be here. Um, this is an issue that uh, I've cared a lot about, uh, both in my current role with the Office of American Innovation and also my previous work on Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, prizes and challenges, as I know, kind of preaching to the choir here, but they represent a tremendous possibility to really transform the way that innovation is delivered inside government and for the public at large. Um, I'd like to take a step back. You know, I, I really came to, uh, my, I know that I believe the next speaker, or one of the speakers further in the agenda uh, is from DARPA, and that's really how I came to, to be, you know, really as a, as a member of the public. Uh, came to be aware of the role of prizes and challenges, and obviously that's in relation to sort of these grand challenges that we saw with sort of the, the around the autonomous vehicles, um, which you know got me interested in sort of the X Prize Foundation and how that played a role with commercial space flight, and well, you know, and historically speaking, with the first uh, transatlantic flight in the 1920s, you know, going back even further to 1714 with the Longitude Prize. Um, you know, each of these prizes, uh, at these large prizes, has the same elements that, uh, regardless if your prize or challenge is, is very tactical and something that is uh, a few weeks in duration or a grand challenge that can last many years, 
um, they all have some really core elements that that I that I that I that resonate with me, and perhaps with you. And that is uh, one: they're open to anybody. I mean, you really can be uh, somebody who's an expert in the field, or somebody who has an idea, or someone who's an expert in another field, and apply uh, that expertise and the creativity and perspective to. Uh, the challenge ahead. In fact, the Longitude Prize itself, and many of you probably know this, you know, it was a watchmaker who ultimately came up with the solution um, and who was uh, heavily resisted by some of the uh, people at Oxford at the time for his proposal, but he ultimately won the challenge because he understood that time could be how you measure distance uh, versus using the stars. And so this, you know, was not something that anyone who was an expert in navigation at the time would have ever thought of. And end up being not only the solution to that problem, but the foundation for navigation uh, to this day. And so, you know, this is what I uh, that that idea that anyone can lean in, anyone can contribute, anyone is welcome to participate in solving a problem uh, collaboratively, is something that is, resonates very strongly with me, with the Office of American Innovation, and and with uh, hopefully all of you. Uh, the second aspect of it is that really, uh, from a government perspective, you only pay for success. Uh, you know, you have the opportunity to put out a problem, to put out a challenge, uh, to put out something that needs to be solved, um, and the government's really only on the hook if we get the outcome we desire. Um, and so, in contrast with some of the more traditional procurements, it's a fantastic opportunity to really solve some of these problems, both large and small. Um, so from an administration perspective, we're deeply supportive of prizes and challenges. Um, we have some things kind of that we're working on with a lot of the stakeholders uh, in uh, a couple different agencies. Um, and uh, we just believe very strongly that it represents an opportunity for all agencies and programs to think creatively about how to solve problems. It's not a panacea, certainly. Um, it won't be the uh, strategy to solve every problem, um, but it can really be a tool that's leveraged creatively um, you know, throughout the federal government. Um, those of you who are, uh, who, those of you for whom this is not your first uh, community of practice meeting know better than I that the record since the Competes Act passed in 2010 of federal prizes and challenges in the government is remarkable. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of challenges that have taken the place across dozens of agencies um, that have delivered remarkable results. And so that's something that uh, can be celebrated. Uh, for, it is celebrated on both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill, wearing my old hat, and it certainly is celebrated by the predecessor uh, administration to mine, and uh, it continues to this day. So it's an area that brings people together, whether they're experts in the field, whether they're uh, you know people that are just dabbling from another discipline. It's a, uh, a program that brings people together whether they are from the right side of the aisle, the left side of the aisle. Um, so this is something that's really special for the country and hopefully can be a vehicle uh, for solving problems at your agencies uh, going forward. And, uh, you know, we're very excited uh, about the work that the GSA team is doing with challenge.gov uh, to help facilitate uh, some of that uh, programs at, at your agencies. Um, and so with that, that's really all I wanted to come here and say today is that you know, we have a tremendous opportunity to solve real problems for the American people, to do so in a very creative way that not only involves uh, traditional stakeholders, but anyone in the country who wants to help out, uh, and that the administration strongly supports the efforts that you are doing uh, to bring about those programs and prizes and challenges in your agency. Um, I'd like to take a few questions just because I feel like in the spirit of prizes and challenges, there should be some give and take. So I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you have. I'm okay if there aren't any, by the way. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you noticed any trends in the past couple of years in terms of what sorts of challenges we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, and I'm, and I'm not the expert in the way that Kelly and Tammy are, but from what I've noticed is uh, it's an expansion of the scope of these challenges. So, and this might again just be from my vantage point, but I've always came to them from the perspective that it had to be these like audacious grand challenges that took multiple years and was solving a transformative problem uh, in the way that the autonomous vehicle grand challenge you know, did for DARPA. Um, and there's certainly a role for that, that we strongly embrace. But what I've noticed over the last few years, particularly because of the Competes Act Authority, is an expansion of these prizes and challenges to somewhat like very tactical near-term problems. Like we need to develop a business plan for, uh, you know, how do we solve 
a certain problem that's facing our agency or one of our stakeholders, or you know, we're, uh, you know, we uh, sort of, I'm trying to think of a good example, but things that are much more tactical, much more two, three month challenges that can really turn about um, a solution. One example that I'm just familiar with given my background is when uh, the Congress had a, uh, there's a, this is gonna be a little in the weeds, but there's an international standard around open legislative data uh, called the Comunitoso, which is based primarily in Europe and Africa. Uh, the congressional standard for legislative data is different because we have a slightly different system and the work of combining the American data standard with the international data standard was ultimately put out to a present challenge. And I believe it took about six months. So again, super niche, <laughs> super in the weeds, but we ultimately were able to do, create a solution using this vehicle. Um, and that's on the same scale of success that we, on the other hand, has, you know, we're creating the autonomous vehicle industry <laughs> um, with Stanley and that whole success with DARPA. So Again, like that to me is the trend that I've seen is it doesn't just have to be reserved for these transformative challenges. It can be much more tactical. Oh, and the other thing I'd like to add there just because it comes to mind is the capacity to do this in government is continually getting stronger, right? It's like a muscle memory that's being developed every season, every year. Uh, as this community of practice gets stronger, as the expertise in your agencies get stronger, as your lawyers get more comfortable and your agency heads get more comfortable and your HR people get more comfortable with these kinds of challenges, um, the government's ability to do this work uh, is getting stronger and better and, and, and more effective. Well, awesome. It's been a real privilege to be here today. Um, I just, again, want to stress, we really love the work that you guys are doing. I personally am, am grateful just as a citizen that this kind of work is is happening. And I think there's tremendous opportunity to involve the public in solving some really important problems and ultimately restore the public's faith in governing institutions by showing them that, you know, we can work with uh, in creative and, uh, and nimble ways. So thank you, thanks again and have a great day today. <laughs>
for technical challenge platforms that will better support your needs. We are pursuing next steps in that procurement process and we'll keep you all updated. For the newcomers, we've developed a few tools to help you engage your colleagues in leadership and to gain their informed support for crowdsourcing in the future. These resources are designated for you to customize and communicate with audiences that matter most to you. We will make these tools available to you along with a user guide in the near future. So I know it's, hard, it's difficult to see, but <clears throat> these three tools were developed. Uh, the first one is really a snapshot about challenge.gov and prizes in general. Um, it gets straight to the data, uh, the high impact points, and in a very clear, um, easy to understand uh, one pager. The second one is um, dives into what is a prize competition. This is something that you can use internally, and there are fields that are customizable where you can put in your own data. Um, and then success stories where you can highlight your own success stories and we also have some that we can give you as well depending on who it is you're trying to influence, which hearts and minds you're trying to win over internally, leadership you're trying to convince, legal you're trying to convince, whoever it is that you're trying to get on board to run a competition. We really hope that these tools will be of value to you. So you will see these uh, soon, we'll be rolling these out with the user guide. And on that note, um, and with a very full slate of speakers today, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So next, I would like to welcome Colonel Matt Hepburn of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, to discuss his work on a challenge that is showing tremendous outcomes today. Matt is a program manager in the Biological Technologies Office at DARPA, one of the federal government's pioneers in inducement prizes. Since joining DARPA in 2013, he has aimed to address the dynamic threats of emerging infectious diseases with potential impact on national security. Prior to joining DARPA, Matt served as the Director of Medical Preparedness on the White House National Security Staff. With previous assignments around the globe, we know him as a valued and trusted mentor on the Challenge.gov program. Please join me in welcoming. welcoming. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Okay, I think I have some slides. Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to uh, kind of kick this thing off and uh, appreciate the discussions. It is, um, I agree with what the previous speaker said, that there's this muscle memory effect, I think, in terms of running challenges. And I, uh, it's been really fun to see the momentum, even after a few years. I'm going to talk about a challenge we did. Um, sort of not on the huge, massive, grand challenge, robotics or autonomous vehicles that DARPA has a tradition of, but it was sort of in that small to medium-sized challenge category. And um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about the results or sort of the long-term impact of it. And also try to give you some, in, some insight into, I think, what worked, what didn't, what I found what was really challenging about it. Um, but I do, uh, yeah, so this was back in 2014 and I was just looking at the slide you put up and having like all these tools and things and here's how you do it and all these how-to guides and mentors. Um, not in 2014, we had to, uh, these, were, these were fairly early days. But I think it's, it's emblematic of the progress and it's emblematic of the drive, the leadership that challenge.gov has provided to this whole process and sort of this community of interest. And I love how you guys have organized this. I love how it's not, you're not bossing people around, you're not saying you shall or, hey, you know, it's like it's like bring people together um, to come up with best practices. I, 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 love, I love what that's done and I think it does. It reflects now why you're seeing so many of these challenges come through. So, um, so I want to talk about, so I'm, I'm an infectious diseases physician and now been at DARPA um, uh, four and a half years, which is kind of in the forever category. Usually people don't stay, usually it's about a, a program managers are there for in the neighborhood of two to four years. And so, um, so I've been there a long time. Um, the, uh, but in my early days of DARPA, this is back in 2014, um, I, was, I was inspired by, if you will, our tradition of, of using challenges as a mechanism to, to drive progress forward. Um, and in particular, came up with a challenge to uh, forecast infectious diseases. And, um, and I'll tell you the story exactly of, of how it happened. Um, we got a call from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And again, this was in the summer of 2014. So, um, flashback to uh, when, when chikungunya virus uh, 
uh, was was causing really a, a, a substantial and, and horrible epidemic um, in the Western Hemisphere. And it wasn't, we, we say newly introduced, it had been here, but it had never caused the impact um, that it had. So chikungunya was, uh, for our, our short-term memory society, it was sort of the Zika before the, the Zika. And, uh, um, uh, but, a, but a debilitating illness spread by mosquitoes um, were uh, in the neighborhood of, we, we quote anywhere in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 40 percent um, a year, two years, even three years after acute infection that people still have a chronic joint pain. And that joint pain can be debilitating um, so that people can't work. And, uh, and again, this disease, which causes hundreds of thousands of cases worldwide every year, um, that's a really big deal, right? So you're, you're uh, first of all, the, you know, it, it, it's horrible to suffer acutely, but also the chronic uh, joint pain, um, ap in the chronic joint pain um, results um, and damage that that causes is very significant. So, um, but it was, it was essentially causing an epidemic in the Western Hemisphere. OSTP called us and said, well, is this gonna come to the United States? And where is it going to go next? Because it had been, it had uh, caused uh, substantial outbreaks in some of the Caribbean nations. It hadn't spread to other places. Um, and they said, "Well, we need to, we need to forecast what's going to happen next." And as as obvious as that may sound to this audience, um, the capacity for us to do that in the infectious diseases community, whether we're in the Department of Defense or in the U.S. government or the WHO or or, or the global community, is very very limited. It's very, very limited. And um, as you mentioned in my previous job, where we, uh, uh, my title was Director of Medical Preparedness. And, and my job was to think about how we as a government respond, uh, or prepare and respond to the next pandemic. Um, and one of the capabilities we need to have is an ability to forecast. We need to say, here's what we think the epidemic's gonna do. At every stage throughout, not just at the beginning, but, but throughout. And, and as sensible as that sounds to you, um, like uh, when, when I talk about this, people are like, well, we don't already do that. Why, why aren't we doing that? That's, um, um, uh, it, it's, it's hard to do. It's fundamentally hard to predict where infectious diseases outbreaks are going to occur and what their trajectory is going to be throughout. Um, so, uh, but it's ARPA, we like hard problems. And we got a call from OSTP and they said, are you guys forecasting? And I said, well, we're doing a little bit here and there, but we don't really have, we don't have, we don't, ha I can't give you a forecast right now. And they said, well, okay, well, we need one. <laughs> and said, you know, because again, they're making big decisions. Like, is it coming to the United States? Should we try to create a vaccine? Should we do all these other, you know, mosquito um, control interventions? I said, well, I don't know. Um, so that, that was the seed planted, though, where we said we have to make progress in this field. And furthermore, we said, well, why can't we run a challenge to try to tackle this problem? And uh, again, it was, it was a tragic situation, um, but also a very unique opportunity where we had this, this virus that was causing huge epidemics, which had never happened before in the Western Hemisphere. So the premise of the challenge was actually very simple. It was uh, using publicly available knowledge, forecast the spread of chikungunya virus in the Western Hemisphere to every country that reports to the essentially the WHO equivalent, the Pan American Health Organization, for a six-month period. And you will be judged on your ability, your accuracy. And we 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 spent, and I guess one of my main points of this whole talk is that we spent uh, a tremendous amount of time um, thinking through very carefully. Uh, how, uh, what we wanted to forecast and how we would award the prizes for the winners. And uh, my one bit of advice that I probably said it last year I, when I presented it this and maybe the year before is that like thinking and spending tons of time and effort thinking through what the rules are going to be for the challenge, um, I think it's the most important part. Um, people are only going to play if they know what the rules are, and it has to be fair, right? And so if, if, if they feel like, oh, there's unfairness to the process, or if they feel like, uh, you know, well, we're judging this way, but halfway through we change the game on them, um, it creates all sorts of problems. Furthermore, you judge compared to, like, what we want, and we did, we really wanted them to uh, tell us what was going to happen. So the rules of the game were not tell us what's happening now. It was, you got more, you got better points if you were able to predict accurately far into the future than if you were able to predict two weeks ahead of time. Does that make sense? So, so um, uh, that's, if you're going to spend time there, 
that you know that's what you got to get that right and talk we we talked to all sorts of experts we brought in math people we we had brainstorming sessions and whiteboarded all day and night and presented it again and again and again before we actually released the challenge so um and we we also uh just to note like we had we had uh we had a company who uh, uh, essentially had done a bunch of challenges before and helped us administer those challenges and said, okay, this is, um, they didn't know anything about chikungunya, but they knew a lot about the challenge community and how to reach out and how to, again, make sure that the rules were fair. So, so the punchline message is um, we ran this, we ran this challenge. We had some prizes. Um, and I'm going to tell you about three essential fundamental points that came out of this. Um, the first is that what we loved about it is that um, most of the people that did well uh, were not necessarily the infectious diseases, chikungunya world experts, that we were able to reach out to a community, uh, people who are very good at math and computer science, and especially if they teamed up um, with public health expertise, that seemed to be the magic combination to be successful. But it wasn't that you had to spend your whole career studying infectious diseases. Um, and this idea of recruiting other people other than infectious diseases experts in to solve our infectious diseases problems is a fundamental theme of my time at DARPA. And I think this was, this, this was a perfect venue and way to get the message out and to be able to do that. So that was a big success. I think what I would say is the, um, the, the two other just very quick points on this is that um, uh, on, on one level, uh, it worked, our forecasting, um, our forecasting and our winners did very well. And on another level, they did very poorly. So on the level of when an outbreak was already starting in a given country, um, they were able to say, okay, here's what we think the trajectory of that outbreak is going to look like. Um, so we know it's here now. There are, you know, a thousand cases and in about four weeks, you're going to see 10,000 cases. Okay. Um, the, uh, and they did that pretty well. And that was actually incredibly informative. And um, in our public health communities now, that sort of our ability to do that for chikungunya and other viruses, I think, is continuing to make much progress. Um, what everybody was terrible at is when is it going to spread to the new country? And that was ultimately the question that we had. Um, when is it going to spread to the United States? And, it, you know, in, it, it really didn't. It didn't cause major outbreaks in the United States and subsequent, and still could, but it, it hasn't um, in subsequent years. But it, it did spread to a lot of other countries in the Western Hemisphere, and that was really hard to predict. It just was. It was really, really hard to predict. But what we did from there is said, okay, how then do we design programs to address this? What do we need to do so that we can then predict this for the future? Where is that outbreak going to be? Okay. And so, so what we did, two, two interesting kind of follow-ups from this um, the a, after running this challenge. So um, the, we, we, as we, we had all these results and we said, okay, we have these models. And we went over to the Pan American Health Organization. Again, they're sort of, they're called, they call PAHO. They're, they're, think of their, they're the WHO equivalent for our hemisphere. And they're located here in, in town. So didn't have to fly somewhere exotic. Um, and, uh, and so we went in there and we met, we had a whole day long thing. And we said, here are the results and here's what we found and all these other things. And they said, um, thank you very much. And they said, great, well, what are you gonna do about it? And the, the, the tragedy of chikungunya as a lot of our other emerging infectious diseases is that um, we don't have a licensed vaccine. We don't have a licensed treatment. Um, so uh, their point, you can do mosquito control measures, but their point was really, um, develop our forecasting community, but you have to complement that with uh, developing our response as well. Does that make sense? And so, um, so I, I mean, really as a result of this challenge and, and so this, this really struck a chord with me, frankly, <laughs> you know, and, um, and uh, so, so what I want to do is, is very briefly tell you about, so what answering that question. So, um, so, we want to develop a vaccine, or more particularly, we want to develop antibodies that we could give you um, so that you don't get chikungunya. And I'm doing this um, not, be, not, not only because I think this is a severe disease and a global health, um, certainly a, a very impactful and tragic infection from a global health perspective, but also um, we always say the D in DARPA is for defense. And so one of my missions at DARPA is to 
essentially protect a worldwide deployed military force. So if we're going to ask people to go to a, a region where infectious diseases are endemic, we feel an obligation in the Department of Defense to protect them with vaccines and treatments and different things so that they don't get so that they don't get sick. Um, as a consequence of that, chikungunya is very high, fairly high on their list. And so um, what I, again, very briefly, I want to show you a slide. We have an entire program now that's aimed at this concept of if I can uh, give you a shot and then you are protected from an infection within 72 hours of that shot, um, and we can make thousands of doses in that in a very short period of time, um, we think we really need that for the next pandemic. And so... Um, Without going into the science too much, the idea is, is that if I can give you a shot with DNA or RNA that tells your cells to make an antibody that protects you, um, we'd be really cooking. So if we can find that antibody, uh, take a bunch of DNA and RNA, manufacture it up at scale, and then deliver that, we can have thousands of doses in a short period of time. So this is a early program for your investment. But the reason I'm bringing this up to you is essentially um, just to make the point that um, for this, what we call the pandemic prevention platform, um, to prove that this works, we have to take it through start to finish. Uh, DOD jargon is, DOD, is a capability demonstration. What that means is I give them, a, I say, here's your viral target, come up with an antibody, come up with an antibody, manufacture it, and, and get to a clinical trial in a very short period of time. And the, the point for this, for this presentation is with this program and actually a couple other projects that I currently have, we are prioritizing chikungunya to, do, to develop products, antibody and vaccine products, to address exactly what Paho said, okay? And so, it, but it, it, I'm gonna take it back to our original problem, which is if we are gonna do a clinical trial to see if a chikungunya product works, where do we do that clinical trial? Well, we have to figure out, we have to be able to predict and forecast where that, where that next chikungunya outbreak is going to occur and have our clinical trial go there and figure out if our vaccines and our treatments work. So again, it comes full circle. Do you see what I mean? So we're continuing to invest in the infectious diseases forecasting space from the lessons learned for our challenge so that we can forecast, develop treatments, and, and ultimately, um, you know, again, go big and say, can we eradicate chikungunya as an infection? And then, then we move on to the next one. Um, I have three minutes left, probably. I was hoping to have a couple more minutes for questions, but I'd love to, if there's one or two questions or comments from the audience before I get off stage. Yeah. Yes. So the challenge provided our foundation and we said, okay, here's where the state of the art is. Here's what's good. Here's what's, here's what people can do well. Here's what they can do poorly, followed up by a targeted investment for a project to say, okay, these groups, please, you know, fix that and go forward. Um, and, and that's also, it is nice to have that if, if your department or agency can sort of well, yeah, the lesson learned is run the challenge, but be very thoughtful about what you can do with those results. And can you follow it up with investment or, can, you know, what, what's the transition or what's the next step? It could also be working with other departments and agencies. I see some deep in the back there with from Health and Human Services. A lot of what you heard about today, we have a very close relationship with Health and Human Services with NIH and CDC and BARDA and those groups. So the follow-up doesn't necessarily even have to be your group. Um, we're working very closely, for example, with modeling groups at HHS. And uh, another translation of, of this initial investment is that the people that did a lot of effort forecasting chikungunya infection in our challenge and elsewhere are the ones that we're now relying on to forecast where Zika infection is going to go in the subsequent years. But that follow-up, that's a great point. Think about that follow-up, you know, okay, with these results, where can it go? But it doesn't just necessarily have to be your team. Uh, one other question? We good? Yeah. So, so as you know, Casey's doing the flu forecasting every year. So uh, I'm kind of curious. This, there seems to be a few programs, disease-specific programs, to do forecasting. Is there like an effort to to like coordinate that or take lessons from one disease area and apply it to another? Yeah. That, first of all, outstanding, outstanding question because there is, but it's also nascent. Um, there is, but it's also nascent. And I'll give you a, a specific example. So you cited the CDC Influenza Forecasting Challenge, um, which is a multi-year 
uh, challenge. They, they, they run this every year. They were running this, I think they just started when we were bringing this online. And Matt Biggerstaff and the CDC staff, work group that worked on that gave us tremendous advice in terms of how to construct this and all this other stuff. So it was a great collaboration, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, they're, 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 for, they're doing this every year now. They're, I think they're five years in, and they get better every year. And it shows the effect, you know, again, another model, different than ours. Ours was a one-off. Um, there is tremendous power in a annual, an annual challenge. Um, and I, I've seen that, that group make tremendous progress as a result. Um, uh, your point is, is, is well taken. We forecast one infection in one group, and how does that come together? Um, as a government, we need to do a better job of it. But I do want to shout out to HHS BARDA. Their, their mission is the advanced development of products like vaccines and treatments for pandemics. And so this program, as example, is linked in very closely with what HHS BARDA is trying to do. The foresight that HHS BARDA has had, though, is to have a modeling and forecasting group for designing their clinical trials and things like that over the last few years. And during some of our recent crises, like the West Africa Ebola crisis and now for Zika, um, they've performed that coordination function where they've, held mod they've gotten academic and government modelers together and said, okay, rallying around Zika. Um, there, but I, I will, I'd leave you with, there, there's a lot more room for improvement as a government um, to do this better, uh, to, to do this better. But again, you know, putting three or four challenges together, showing the state of the art and, and the progress that's being made is a great way to kind of, you know, make the case that our, we, need a, we need more investment as a government to do this. Does that make sense? Great question, though. Um, that's my time. One more question? Sure, I'd love to take another question. Anyone else? Any questions online, Tammy? No questions online? Okay. Uh, well, we do have a big thanks. Um... <laughs> We do have a big thanks uh, from Tammy Marcoulier thanking you for stating the importance of taking significant time and effort to develop the I'm rules and you. to make sure the challenge is clear, fair, and rewards appropriately. Yeah, yeah. and run these like tests. Like we, we almost, and, and I don't, I, 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 if I were to do it over again, I would even spend more time on that. And, and one of the things we did a little bit is we practiced. So we, we, you know, we said to government experts, let's say a, a government modeling expert, we said, okay, here's the challenge, try to forecast it, you know, do, do like a three day simulation where you're actually going to be one of the competitors and let's see how you did. And, and again, we found bugs in the system, you know, hey, well, what about a this or what about a that? And so, um, yeah, I think that's that you, putting your time up front is, is well worth it. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right, so a big thanks again to um, Colonel Matt Hepburn from DARPA for his talk. And it actually sets us up pretty nicely for the next discussion we'll have around legal authorities. So we talked about rules. Um, and it's important to know as you're planning your prize competition what authorities are available to you to sh help to structure your prize competition. Um, so we've got two folks who are uh, going to be coming up here, Lauren Schmidt and Greg Capella, who are going to be talking about legal authorities. Um, Lauren Schmidt is the Senior Director of Pathways at the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, or DIUX, which aims to fundamentally change the way the Department of Defense does business. Since joining DIUX, she has developed a first of its kind rapid acquisition mechanism called the Commercial Solutions Opening, which leverages other transaction authority to execute fast, flexible and collaborative deals with top tier technology companies across the country. As a result of her work, DIUX has deployed more than $180 million to over 60 companies in the past year in areas as diverse as machine learning, autonomy, and commercial space. Prior to her position at DIUX, Lauren played key acquisition roles within the US Army, including operations of a 6,000 person organization managing over 600 weapon systems programs and contracts totaling more than $7 billion. So I'm gonna ask Lauren to come on up. And joining her is Greg Capella, um, who was appointed the Deputy Director of the National Technical Information Service in January 2016. For those of you who may be unaware, NTIS sits within the Department of Commerce. 
Prior to joining NTIS, he served at the Department of Homeland Security in 2009 as the Deputy Director of the Enterprise Systems Development Office, and then as Acting Executive Director until joining NTIS. Prior to that, Greg served in the commercial sector as the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of InfoPro Incorporated from 2005 to 2008, and a Director at CGI and FICO Corporations from 1998 to 2005. He's a retired U.S. Air Force veteran, having led various high-level initiatives in technology, research, uh, development, and implementations from 1980 to 1996. Greg, please come on up. Perfect. Well, thanks everybody for having me here. I'm really excited to be in the, with this group of people from across the federal government who are all in, incredibly passionate about innovation and how we can do things differently from a government perspective. Um, let's see. So I'm Lauren Schmidt, I'm the Senior Director for Pathways at DIUX, and I'm going to talk to you today not about prize competitions or prize challenges, but rather how we've used other transaction authorities to create a new competitive process to prototype non-traditional technology. So first, what is DIUX? DIUX stands for the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. Um, we were started in about April of 2015 by then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, and our mission is to accelerate commercial innovation into the Department of Defense. And why do we exist, right? Why is it important for us to reach out to non-traditional vendors, those vendors who don't typically do business with the Department of Defense or the federal government? Well, the reason is uh, traditionally government has been a major sponsor of innovation, right? You think about DARPA, especially traditionally um, coming up with technologies like GPS, like the internet, right? We really started a lot of that innovation. However, over the past few decades, that trend has significantly shifted. Private and commercial R&D now um, comprises almost $250 billion more than federal R&D. And what that means is that today's technology of consequence is not being developed or sponsored by the government, but rather by the commercial sector for the commercial sector. However, it's paying off in significant dividends in areas that's very important for the government, right? Areas like autonomous systems or new commercial space technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So all of these new technologies that are gonna fundamentally change the way that we fight wars in the future are coming out of the commercial sector by vendors that don't traditionally work with the DOD. So why aren't we working with these vendors already? Or actually, sorry, I forgot I have this on here. Just a few examples, right? And you know these, um, Amazon Prime and a lot of companies developing commercial drone technology that's being used today. Um, Oculus Rift is an example from Facebook of new ways of doing augmented and virtual reality. Um, Waymo, I just saw in the New York Times yesterday that driverless cars have been approved for use in California starting in April, right? So all of this technology is here today and you can easily imagine um, many, especially defense use cases for these technologies, but we have yet to really ingest and use them in the Department of Defense when they're being used commercially already. So this is the reason they don't traditionally work with us, right? Um, obviously, I'm, I'm from the Department of Defense, and this is a depiction of our defense acquisition system. Um, very, very bureaucratic, very complicated. Unless you've spent your entire career in defense acquisition, um, it would be hard for you to understand as a company how to cut through this, especially if your primary clients are commercial clients, right? Um, why would you want to go through all of this to work with and sell to the Department of Defense? Um, you know, a lot of people would say, well, DOD has so much money, of course, anyone would want to compete for our dollars. But the fact is, for a lot of these technology companies, they can much, make much more money much more quickly by selling to the commercial sector rather than investing in their business infrastructure to sell to the Department of Defense. So the solution for us to get through that is to fundamentally change the way that we do business as a department, as a government. We have to be able to move fast at the speed of business, right, to keep up with these, um, these different companies and to be attractive customers to them. We have to be able to be flexible, right, not to come in and say, here's our contract and here's everything that you have to sign and there's nothing that you can do to negotiate around that. Um, and finally, collaborative, right, particularly in Silicon Valley, which is where I'm located, um, it's very much a culture of collaboration, right? Let's work together to solve these problems. And I think that's the same um, ethos that comes out of a lot of these different prize competitions, right? How do we work together and collaboratively with industry to solve the thorniest problems that face us? 
Um, and we've been able to do all of this by developing what we call our commercial solutions opening or our CSO, which is a new competitive process that uses other transaction authorities. Has anyone here heard of other transaction authorities? Awesome, perfect, that's more than I expected. So that's really exciting, <laughs> particularly DARPA, I know you guys had. <laughs> um, so other transaction authorities, just for those who aren't aware, are essentially um, lower, lowercase c contracts that the Department of Defense and some other agencies can let that don't have to follow all of the rules and regulations of the FAR. So it gives us a lot more flexibility to construct individual deals for particular projects um, and a new way of, of structuring and doing competitions that um, is outside of the normal defense uh, way of doing business. So since we're talking about legal authorities, right, our legal authority for this comes from 10 USC 2371B. Um, it's OT authority to run prototype projects, which is what we use at DIUX specifically, although you can use OT for basic and applied research as well. Um, so at first it allows us to carry out prototype projects. That's what the statute says. Um, the prototype is not defined in statute. So a lot of people would think, okay, this is just a new version of something that hasn't come out yet, right? But it can be a product, a methodology, a process, um, agile development, right? A new way of doing software development that's standard practice in the commercial industry, but that is not really used in DOD. Um, it can also be used to assess the military utility of a commercial product. So let's say there's a commercial product that's out there that's already being sold on the shelves, but we haven't yet been able to use it in DOD. We can use this prototype authority to do a limited test and pilot to say, does this commercial technology have application in DOD? If so, great, let's use that and start, start using it. Um, it next says, to the maximum extent practicable, competitive procedures shall be used but it does not, again, define competitive procedures. So obviously we have a responsibility to make sure that we're being responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars, um, but we're not, we're not relegated to just using the methods of competition of the FAR. You could absolutely use OT authorities in conjunction with prize authorities, for example, and run challenges and award OTs through there. There's a lot of different possibilities of how you can use these authorities. So I would strongly encourage everybody to look into that and how you can use these authorities um, for your own challenges and the way that you conduct business. Um, and finally, and this is the most exciting part for me, um, a follow-on production contract or transaction may be awarded without the use of competitive procedures. What this means is if we award a successful prototype that was competitively awarded in the first place, we can then move from prototype into production without having to conduct another competition. That's incredibly powerful because it helps us skip over that valley of death that traditionally happens between prototyping a technology. You found something great, now people wanna use it, but now let's go back into the traditional um, FAR-based or acquisition-based Com competition where you know it's going to be a year and a half before we're able to get this into the hands of warfighters. We want to be able to accelerate that timeline and get better technology into the hands of our warfighters as soon as possible. Um, and so DIUX has awarded the first two production OTs ever. It's actually now three um, in the Department of Defense. This authority was new as of FY16, and we've been the first ones to demonstrate that you can actually do it. But we're really excited for other people to follow in our footsteps because it's incredibly powerful. Uh, more advantages here, right, of using the CSO rather than um, typical FAR-based contracts. Our solicitations are posted on our website. It's a Google form. It's very easy, right? Again, as a non-traditional company who, many of whom have never heard of FedBizOps, right? And you don't have to go on there and try and find the particular solicitation. It's just on our website. It's easy to find. Um, it, we can do awards in less than 60 days, and that's all the way from solicitation to developing the project collaboratively with the company to negotiating and awarding the OT. Um, our fastest has been 31 days. I would say on average, we're probably closer to 80 or so days. Um, negotiable payment milestones, negotiable terms and conditions, negotiable IP and data rights. Again, it really gives a lot of power into the hands of the contracting officer or the agreements officer to structure a particular deal based on the individual um, idiosyncrasies of that project, that company, that DOD customer. Commercial accounting standards, right? We don't have our companies have to use government accounting standards, again, because most of them don't have that and would not opt into that if that were a requirement. And again, finally, as I mentioned, follow on procurement without the use of competitive procedures, which is really powerful. A few success stories, right? As mentioned, I think in the intro, um, we've done about 61 of these pilot OTs thus far. Now three of them transitioned into production, um, almost $200 million in 60 to 90 days. Um, a couple examples up here. Um, I'll just talk about two of them. One in the lower left-hand corner 
is a company called Shield AI that makes autonomous quadcopter drones that can zoom around in the in interior of buildings and map them out and send them back to people, right? Um, really powerful technology that's really exciting. Um, one thing I'll talk about this really briefly is that we were able to modify because of the flexibilities of OTs, the contract after it had already started outside of its original statement of work. So again, it's a, it's a very small lightweight quadcopter that can zoom around very quickly, but because it's so small, it has a limited battery life. Um, we, we first started this contract after we'd, after we'd signed it, we had actual warfighters using this technology. And when the warfighters are using it, they're you know letting it go and you can easily imagine, they said, well, there's situations where we don't want to be standing right next to the buildings that we want to map out, right? Um, we want to map out different buildings that maybe are a little bit more dangerous, right? Is there a way that we could mount this small quadcopter on top of a lar longer range drone and send it from farther away? Um, we said, sure, why not? Like we hadn't thought of that before and we were scoping the project, but that makes sense. Let's modify the OT to put in, incorporate your feedback, right? And what that means is we get a much shorter OODA loop between our users, our warfighters, the people that are actually going to use this, and the acquisition team and the company. So we're able to get a better product faster than the traditional process. Um, one more, just because I think it's really interesting in the upper right-hand corner is a, a company called Sonatus um, that I call it a tooth radio because I'm a very non-technical person, but essentially it's a small device that you can implant on the back of your tooth to send and receive signals. So rather than a, a headpiece, right, to, to talk to people like Bluetooth, um, it's actually on your, on your tooth, which means that if you're jumping out of a plane or you're going into a firefight, instead of having to have something on your helmet or obscuring your vision in some way, it's in your mouth. And when you're speaking and listening, it sounds as if the person is right next to you in a quiet room, right? Again, really interesting technology that was originally developed as a type of hearing aid for people. So that's it, I know we have limited time, but um, if there are any questions real quick before we transition? Yes. So 10 USC is specifically for DOD, but I think that there are, I could be wrong, eight to 10 other federal agencies that do have OT authority. I know NASA is one, and I don't know the others off the top of my head. Um, but it's certainly something I would encourage you to look into. And if you don't have it, to go to Congress and ask for that authority, because I think this is authority that could apply to any mission um, across the federal government. Questions? All right, I'll hand it off to my colleague. Thank you. Given the limited time, I'm going to skip the slides and sort of hit the high points since they're fairly similar. Uh, basically, we have something very similar to other transaction authority called the Joint Venture Authority. We actually have both. We have other transaction authority and Joint Venture Authority, both given to us in Title 15. Um, for those of you who want to look it up, 3704B. Uh, basically, be simpler if you look underneath our name, National Technical Information Service. It'll bring you right to it. But basically, it is the ability to partner with industry and provide those services to the federal government, DOD, and civilian. We um, have had this authority since 88, and last year we did about 174 million in business. Um, we are actually transitioning and refocusing our efforts. So let me give you kind of a thumbnail. Basically, some of the same parameters as other transaction authority and one of the reasons why we haven't actually implemented our ethnic transaction authority thus far. Joint venture partners, our name, name uh, then I'll differentiate. We uh, chose 31 partners we work with. Those included 11 large businesses, uh, four um, basically not-for-profit, or excuse me, universities, two not-for-profits, and the rest were small and mid-sized businesses. Uh, an example is Stanford's one of our partners. Uh, a large business, you know, you, you can imagine the big, uh, big 11 that might come to mind. We can partner with them and they can partner with whomever to actually bring services to the federal government. Now, when I say services, that included, for instance, we are just completing our fourth project with HHS, Health and Human Services, OIG, where we actually help them take their organization from basically a lot of commercial, um, not well integrated applications it's very well um, a very nice siloed applications integrating it bring it to the cloud and creating new analytics platforms for understanding fraud you can imagine a portfolio of 1.1 trillion a year spend they have the opportunity there to capture and recover for the taxpayer quite a bit 
Um, separate from that, we've also worked with DHS, quite a bit with DOD, and almost all the, uh, the major uh, civilian organizations. So the other transactional authority is provided for us to do things outside the FAR. And I have to be very explicit, this is strictly independent of the FAR. It's an action activity that does not have any FAR um, ties, tethers. What we do is we actually talk to folks about ways we can innovate in data science. And uh, we can do that for anybody in the federal government. So in a nutshell, those would be the main differentiators. Basically, complete and independent of the FAR, where you can uh, provide services. There's no true head cap, so there's no upward bound, although the projects tend to be smaller. Our largest customer was about 55 million, but uh, we tend to start our projects at about a half million. And as people get comfortable with this authority, we tend to grow and have multiple follow-ons. So that's a very quick thumbnail. I know we only had a total of 20 minutes, I think, uh, for today. So um, questions on, on our authorities? Yes. How did you select your partners? We um, advertised in the Federal Register, and then we down-selected from 80 potentials. So uh, we are actually going to probably have an on-ramp and an off-ramp. Just a caveat, unlike the uh, um, what you just heard, we do not do classified today. We are looking at that as an option going forward. But today, as I talked to you, we do not do classified work. Um, it's not prohibitive. We just haven't gone there. Yes. Um, so I guess I don't understand the difference between OT and the Joint Venture Authority. Maybe if just a couple highlights on, like, here's how it's different. Well, both of us have OT. We haven't exercised ours. Um, and there's other parts of commerce that have OT. Um, that is, I would say, one is that um, they're both focused on innovation. Our, ours, with a, an agreement with Congress, because this is powerful enough to where we could take, undertake quite a few projects, they wanted us to focus in on data science. So we have a scoping uh, that's um, by agreement with Congress to focus on data science where OT can basically has uh, whatever spectrum to help the mission, the war fighting mission. That'd be my number one differentiator. Second is that uh, we are completely independent of the FAR, although I think we both follow federal financial rules. So we can't take 17 money that's expired and use an 18 or just like anyone else. Okay. Yes. The mic is coming, I think. She's running. Example. Could you give an example of a project that this would be useful for? Absolutely. Uh, we helped actually um, for DHS, we helped them um, bring in, um, basically evolve the way in which they were producing some of their um, data science efforts. So we actually were involved with E-Verify. Uh, we had a, this, our big customers, 55 million was with US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So when people apply for uh, citizenship, amnesty or whatever, they follow a set of a forms and it goes into CIS. We help build a new interface, help build some of the back end so that they can integrate the data and get the response back to the various uh, applicants quicker and more accurately and get better analytics on top of it. So that's just one example, HHS, we actually did multiple phases. So the first year we actually helped them evolve. They were SaaS based, great product, commercial product, SaaS-based uh, independent silos, six silos across the United States. They wanted to integrate it. They wanted to bring it to the cloud. They wanted to reduce the O&M, create what we would call a data lake, basically a composite data repository, and uh, make that accessible to all regions so that fraud in California is easily shared with fraud in Florida. Um, over the four year or four projects, we, we got them to the cloud mm -hmm. and we got the new analytics and new um, new tools. Plus, we've brought better and uh, better ways in which to uh, tell that message out to the field. So the people knocking on doors with guns had a very clear understanding of who they're going to see, what the issues were, whether they're hostile or not, so they can go in well informed. So back to your first example, do you work closely with OMB for Paperwork Reduction Act compliance? Oh. Actually, OMB sponsored us for a couple of talks, OFPP, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, as a means of providing innovation. Again, our scope is limited today 
in truth, the, the Title uh, 15 scoping is uh, wide open. So in truth, there's no real constraints that Congress put on us directly in the title. We is through agreement with the uh, legislation that the legislators that we've um, constrained it to data science. It is a power thing and we're not here to compete with the FAR. We're here for that space between where the FAR really picks up well in that quick innovation, that ability to understand. And to use CIS as an example, we are stopping all of our support for the current efforts because they're bringing in vendors to take on the various flows that we've already started. So that, that Death Valley has spoken of is, is a real thing. You have to be very careful to feather in the new with, while killing off the old, if you will, or transitioning the old. And we have worked with CIS to make sure that's very smooth. But we have to be very careful, as spoken of earlier, that you don't lose the momentum and don't lose the innovation by the fact that you have the gap in service. And we, we work with our customers to make sure there's no gaps. Uh, so this is really interesting. Um, first of all, I've, how did you swing getting joint venture authority? I'm kind of curious about the history of that. Um, and second, uh, how do you guys measure yourselves? Um, like what, what's sort of the goals and metrics that you measure? Your success Our organization is completely fee-based. So we are like a small business in the government. And unfortunately, we follow all the federal procurement or our, um, financial rules. So we kind of have um, an interesting dichotomy there. Um, with respect to how did we get it, it was a 1988 law provided by Congress. Congress, um, NTIS has a long history. Uh, we began actually the captured documents from World War II from the Japanese, Germans and such. Things like uh, rocket technologies, uh, some of the synthetic fuels came back to the United States. We were the organizations that housed that and made that accessible to industry and to other organizations in the federal government. Did a good enough job that in 52, um, then President Truman decided to make the NTIS and we became the repository for federal documents. In 88, Congress was pleased with our activities and gave us the additional authority to help pay for the bill of managing all that activity. Stepping back, how do we measure ourselves? Um, we actually are um, very proud of some of the efforts we gave, uh, mentioned, for instance, uh, we, we, we try to make sure our customers are pleased, is, is really customer satisfaction. So we don't measure ourselves on dollars out or number of contracts. We want to, of course, pay our bills. I like getting a salary. But net is that uh, it's really the impact on our customers. Did we achieve something? Uh, we've Almost every one of our projects have um, done pretty darn well. And the ones, and I say almost, um, some are, are more mundane. So we were doing quite a bit of e-training. We we're stepping back from that. It's hard to excel at e-training. It's a commodity. But uh, for the projects that were innovative, where we're going in the future, those are all excelled. I believe I've used my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's uh, let's let's thank our speakers. Thank you. All right. So with that, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Allow you all some time to stretch your legs check those um, emails. Um, I just wanna give a quick reminder where the restrooms are. Um, down this corridor and to the right are the closest restrooms. If you need um, some water or some coffee or a snack, you can go back up the main hallway here uh, to the security desk, turn left, walk to the end of the hall, turn left again, and there's a small snack shop that comes up on the left-hand side. So we're gonna break for 20 minutes and we'll start promptly back at 1010, I believe it is. Um, so we'll, we'll see you soon. Sorry, that's 1030. We'll start back at 1030, thanks.
Thank you so much. But you know.
All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you again for your attendance today. We're ready to kick off the second part of our um, quarterly uh, community of practice meeting. For many of you in the room, the folks up here probably need no introduction, but I'm gonna introduce them anyway. Um, so to my left, Jack Bianco, who works with the small uh, business community to assist and nurture their diverse business enterprises. Um, he is an Eisenhower Fellow, and his fellowship objectives included documenting startup opportunities and challenges in China, highlighting resources that are well regarded by Chinese startups, profiling educational tools and analyzing trends that influence urban and rural entrepreneurship. His post fellowship goal is to craft plans and commitments for business to business collaboration between the US, Chinese and, and Chinese startup companies. And Jack will be serving as our moderator today. Then to my right, I have, uh, starting at the far right, Nancy Merritt, who is a program manager with the Open Innovation Program at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, she has unique experience building the Public Safety Communications Research Innovation Accelerator. Prior to her work at NIST, um, she developed the National Institute of Justice Challenge Program and ran the first Department of Justice Challenge. Her work focuses on supporting scientific research and innovation while developing and streamlining supportive operational in infrastructure. Thank you, Nancy. Um, to her left is Sandeep Patel, who is currently the Open Innovation Manager at the Department of Health and Human Services. He leads the department's use of prizes, crowdsourcing, and other open innovation tools. Since 2010, HHS has run more than 180 prizes to solve wicked problems, develop cutting edge technology, and seed the next generation of health companies. He is a scientist and has built his career on understanding and accelerating the entire innovation pipeline. He has uh, been involved in establishing the Combating Antimicrobial Bacteria Accelerator, maybe best known as CARB-X, uh, the Kidney Innovation Accelerator, and the HRSA Word Gap Challenge. And then right next to me is Jen Garson. She is the Chief of Staff for the Renewable Power Team at the Department of Energy. And she is going to be talking about energy's extensive work uh, helping to grow and mature uh, the energy sector. So thank you. Great, a round of applause for our uh, panelists real quick to welcome them. So thank you again for joining us. It sounds like we had a pretty dynamic discussion this uh, morning, and we're going to dig in a lot deeper uh, with our current panelists. A little bit more about myself. Uh, Tammy talked about a uh, dynamic uh, fellowship I had the luxury of doing last year to explore some issues in China with a focus in terms of the U.S. framework and how U.S.-China relations are going, how China applies innovation, both at the uh, small business or entrepreneurial sector, and then uh, up through their national um, networks. So this is really a, an area of interest for me. My day job is at the US Small Business Administration headquarters. I work on a lot of the national networks that support entrepreneurs, how to start a business, how to grow a business, uh, how to expand using different models, whether it's uh, education that we provide, education through universities or NGOs, and how we connect small businesses with federal partners, either for services, uh, loans or government contracting opportunities. So really a big fan of uh, innovation, both personally and on behalf of the 30 million small business owners here in the United States. Um, we did really brief introductions. I'm gonna ask our panelists to talk a little bit more about themselves in just a second. But obviously this morning we talked a lot about prizes and challenges at the US Small Business Administration. We've been using those authorities for the last few years for different purposes sometimes to recognize award-winning small businesses throughout the nation, other times to set up our network of innovation at the SBA and through what we call resource partners, again, those universities 
NGOs or non-traditional partners, uh, such as accelerators. So the SBA has been uh, deepening our awareness and involvement with co-working spaces, incubators, and accelerators through the last few years. Um, I, I do want to start, and if you all can help me, just sort of let's start a little bit of context before we get into the world of prizes and challenges and the accelerators hosted at federal agencies. Can anybody sort of help me define first what a co-working space is? Anybody with any expertise? Uh, I'll give you a definition if nobody wants to offer one up. Any brave souls? No, let us get it started. So one would argue around the 1990s, the co-working space sort of developed and evolved. Uh, many people attributed to hacker spaces, the coders that were getting together and sharing spaces, sharing equipment. Uh, so pretty much a shared resources uh, type of model. Incubators, anybody? Bueller, Bueller. No, any, uh, or I'll, I'll ask our panelists to any, any suggested definitions for incubators before we get into accelerators or any familiarity where these started? Jen, do you wanna take a stab? All right. So incubators, I think many academics would argue started in sort of uh, the Midwest and agricultural communities, primarily through the land grant universities uh, to support sort of farming efforts. So I think, you know, an academic or researcher would argue that incubators have been around in that context for about uh, 30 to 35 years. Uh, more so today, obviously, we know about them as associated with uh, universities and urban communities. On top of the shared services, quite often now people are adding on mentoring networks, um, opportunities for capital or, or financing and other resources. Uh, there's usually a vested partner associated with or hosting an incubator. Uh, fast forward now into the more dynamic, in my opinion, model of accelerators. L let me ask the panelists, definitely since it's your space, um, how would you highlight an accelerator versus those earlier two models? Um, do you think it's a graduated sort of definition of what we had on decades ago from co-working space into incubators into accelerators? Jen, Sadeep, or Nancy? So accelerators tend to be more time constrained, whereas incubators and co-working spaces are not defined by the certain period of time that a startup um, might be engaged in a program. So accelerators tend to be anywhere between three at the max six months uh, focused on rapid prototyping uh, and other wraparound services that actually help speed up the rate of innovation. Most accelerators have been in the software space. That's where you've typically seen uh, the model generate from. But uh, now increasingly, we're actually seeing the accelerator model applied to more hardware in addition to software. Right, great, great. And again, skin in the game, whether venture capitalists are behind this, and as our panelists will talk about, uh, federal government or other mechanisms that have an objective which drive time, product development, and other objectives. Sandeep, did you want to add on to the sort of that uh, definition? Just one quick consideration. Just, um, I think it's important to note that accelerators, I think, can be uh, uh, in person or can be virtual, right? So you can have a, a sort of a, a co-inhabited space that's more of an incubator type model, or it could be completely virtual where the goal really is just accelerated development. Nancy? And I, I would add that, at least for our model, um, we do like to use as many types of vehicles as we can. So it includes challenges, it includes grants, it includes cooperative agreements, whatever it takes to move the field forward, we want to pull that in and use that. Great, great. And that's a great segue because we're going to ask now the panelists to talk a little bit about their roles at their uh, organizations and how they got involved in the world of accelerators, which dovetails nicely into challenges and prizes. Real quickly on the format, Tammy, we've got now maybe about 45 minutes, right? So we're gonna we're gonna utilize our panelists and, and get as much as we can from them. The panelists all wanna hear your questions. Occasionally we'll take a break to see if anybody has a question. I'm gonna walk around a little bit while our panelists are talking. Feel free to grab me. I'm happy to weave in any individual questions along the way. I told them to keep on their toes. Yeah, so we might all just, we're all going to break up into separate work groups here and do some flip charts and some design thinking along the way. Um, no, with that, let me hand it over. Jennifer, so uh, Tammy gave a really sort of brief introduction. Tell us a little bit That's because more. I'm a derelict and I didn't actually send in my biography. Uh, that is not Tammy's fault. That's my fault. Um, so for a little bit more context, I currently am the Chief of Staff for the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Renewable Power uh, in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, that means I work with our offices of solar, water, geothermal, um, 
and wind offices presently. Um, however, I've been at the department now for about nine years, either as a contractor or as a federal employee, and the bulk of that has actually been spent as a time as a program manager or as an advisor on open innovation. So uh, in my pre previous, previous role, uh, I served as a program manager in our technology to market program focused on developing different models that the Department of Energy could employ to accelerate the rate of innovation for entrepreneurs in the energy space. So that meant uh, I ran a business plan competition. Uh, I started a grant program to actually fund accelerators and incubators out in the private sector to help support uh, commercialization of energy technologies and worked with a lot of our prize managers inside the building uh, who were thinking about using models employed by the private sector to rapidly innovate and figure out how we use those same tools inside the government uh, to accelerate the rate of commercialization of energy technologies. Um, I then was in our Office of Technology Transitions where I served as the Senior Advisor for Open Innovation and we started to think about how do we uh, try to develop um, an internal infrastructure for the agency to support prize managers and also program managers who wanted to use prizes and challenges uh, for the purposes of commercialization and accelerating innovation. Uh, so now in my role as Chief of Staff, I'm sort of serving two roles, <laughs> really still driving uh, the needs of our offices that are present, but also um, helping um, not just the offices that I work with, but others in the department think about using prizes, challenges, and leveraging accelerators and incubators in the private sector uh, to help us accomplish our mission. Super, super. So if folks want to read a little bit more about you, what, what key website or are you on social media if they want to? I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. It's, okay. It's a, yeah. <laughs> great, great. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Sandeep and I had a chance to meet uh, a couple of years ago. I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, sponsoring coffees at other agencies so I can learn and had an opportunity to go over to HHS, which is in our neighborhood of uh, Southwest DC to learn a little bit about their innovation. And uh, we share a Starbucks. So there's this SBA and HHS rivalry of who will create the, the line a little bit longer until we all use technology and order ahead. Sandeep, tell us a little bit more about your, your role and your experience at HHS. Yeah, I was actually gonna say, we have a pretty awesome neighborhood. We have NASA in the neighborhood. Department of Education, uh, you guys, and some others that I, and the, a new museum that just popped up. Um, uh, so I work in the Office of the Chief Technology Officer at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, otherwise known as the IDEA Lab. Um, and we're a small 10 to 15 person-ish team. Uh, and the role of the whole group really is to help support innovation broadly across the department, um, both internally and externally. Uh, and my role specifically, I was hired about four years ago in four years, wow, um, uh, to, to really lead the prize program. So, so my goal is to sort of help the department broadly think about and execute prizes, um, crowdsourcing projects, citizen science projects, um, really think about creative ways where we can leverage talent outside of our organization to help solve problems that we care about. Um, and actually, there's a bunch of HHS folks here. Can you guys raise your hands from HHS? Yeah, awesome. It's like a, a, yeah, cool. Um, so my other, my other job is to help sort of promote and talk about the Austin projects that uh, folks around HS have done. Um, my background, I'm a scientist by background, and so I'm really interested in kind of innovation from bench to bedside and how we make that as fluid as possible. And I think prizes are a really critical component to this um, at the front end because they actually help open the, the barriers to entry um, and allow innovators who we don't normally uh, access through typical grants and contracts and other mechanisms, give them a chance to really innovate and bring insights from different fields. And I think this whole idea of an accelerator is really critical as well, because then, you know, it creates this, this sort of structure in which we can take those ideas and actually move them to products that are useful to, to consumers, to patients, whoever then customer is. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the projects later. Sandeep, real quick, uh, how can folks either look up uh, if they want uh, about the idea lab or, or a little bit of about uh, your work? Are you on social media or what's the Idea Labs URL? So I have a Twitter account, Innovation Wonk. I actually got it like eight years ago whenever Twitter started and then never used it. Um, so only about a year ago have I started actually like viewing things on Twitter and maybe in a year I'll start tweeting things. <laughs> All right, Nancy, um, 
uh, welcome aboard. Nancy's currently with uh, NIST, uh, who's definitely in the innovation space in a number of different categories. We have a luxury of working with NIST on a lot of small business issues. But Nancy, talk a little bit about your uh, current role and efforts there, please. Sure. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, I am. I started out working on challenges at Department of Justice. Uh, my background is research. I'm a criminologist. And I work for the National Institute of Justice. And we were charged and are charged with funding uh, research projects in the field of criminal justice. So several years ago, the government started working on challenges, open innovation, that type of thing. And uh, we picked that up and developed a program there, which is how I got started. Then I had the opportunity to come to NIST. I'm on detail right now to help build their infrastructure for their new PSCR open innovation program. And what we are charged with is developing new uh, innovative ways of dealing with communication in the public safety sector, developing uh, technologies and innovative, innovative working with academics, the, uh, the practitioners, uh, the um, developers that are out in the field and bringing them together to try to push this forward as the new national broadband system for public safety is rolling out. So um, it's been very exciting, very interesting. Um, the main focus to date has been developing an infrastructure. And I think that's really critical because lots of times you think of uh, innovation and uh, accelerators as moving very quickly and they do and that's great but you have to develop that infrastructure. So we've spent a lot of time doing that and we're now uh, sponsoring grants, uh, cooperative agreements, challenges. Um, we're getting to the phase where we can really start uh, moving forward. And so it's a very exciting uh, place to be and time to be here. Super welcome. Again, um, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to dig a little bit further into sort of a, a, a high priority project as defined by their agency or a personal passion. Sindeep, you were telling me a little bit earlier about one of the key projects that, uh, I'm not sure if you all have launched it right now, the, with the uh, health-related kidney project. Can you sort of frame that? Um, also sort of couple um, why you're doing it, how it's structured, and sort of how it taps into the ecosystem there at HHS? Can I hold this for one second? Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry um, I forgot to say um, how you can learn more about the program, uh, pscr.gov. Uh, you can learn a lot more about it there. So please write that down and take a look at it. Thank you, Nancy. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is actually a project that's in development uh, and we're hoping to launch this summer. Um, and it's, uh, it, we're calling it an accelerator. It actually borrows a lot from DOE's uh, catalyst kind of structure. Um, but the, the idea is that we're trying to spur innovation broadly in uh, kidney disease and more specifically in dialysis as a treatment. Um, it's kind of, it's an interesting background. So. Um, uh, dialysis is uh, basically the, the preferred treatment for when your kidneys fail. Um, the other treatment is transplant, uh, getting a kidney transplant, which there are very few kidneys available. Um, dialysis is a 50-year-old uh, technology that really hasn't changed much. It has really poor outcomes. I think about 60% of people die on, uh, within five years when they start dialysis. Um, it's also sort of a quirk in our healthcare system where Medicare essentially pays for all of dialysis um, in the U.S. Uh, it's the only disease that automatically qualifies you for Medicare. So if you're 20 and your kidneys fail and you're on dialysis, you get put on Medicare. Um, and so we spend, uh, the taxpayer spends $35 billion a year on dialysis, um, which is bigger than, it's about the budget of the National Institutes of Health. I think it's, is it bigger than, bigger than DOE, bigger than NASA? It's a huge amount of money um, for really crappy technology. Um, and one of the things that's sort of troubling about this space is that there's just no innovation. Um, there are very few people who actually understand um, some of the, the, basically the needs and the technical challenges around replacing dialysis. Um, and so what we're trying to do broadly is to, again, spur innovation. You were using a prize model, interestingly enough. Um, but the idea is to bring, uh, uh, invite a whole bunch of innovators from lots of different spaces, you know, adjacent spaces, medical, medical device folks from like different fields, um, you know, physical scientists, chemists, physicists, nanotechnologists, um, and, bring them into this space in kind of an accelerated way. And so um, I'm happy, do you want me to dive into the project more? Yeah, yeah. Cindy, can you, tell, you know, what's the length of the project? What is bringing in them? Are they sort of in residence? Do they come in, you know, multiple times for consultations? 
if you could sort of paint that out a little bit more for us. Yeah, so this is inherent. This is inherently a public-private partnership, and there's sort of two pieces to this. One is that we're actually trying to create uh, an innovation fund um, through a prize authority, uh, where we're trying to mix public and private funds together um, to act as seed funding um, and create a competitive process where we would actually award money to uh, really promising, uh, primarily early stage startups, but really make it pretty open. Um, and then the second piece of it uh, is around um, actually aligning our regulatory and reimbursement systems so that it um, makes it clear to innovators like what's going to actually pass through the gates of FDA and CMS, which are kind of important components. So this is designed as like a five to six year project. Um, we envision sort of a series of prizes, basically like a, a annual or biannual set of prizes. Um, um, first focused on dialysis and then we'll probably focus in other areas around kidney disease later on. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually underpinned by the prize authority, but it really is an kind of a virtual accelerator model. Great, thank you. Um, Jen, if I can ask you to talk a little bit about, um, so in much outside of the government space, quite often, whether it's a traditional sort of small business incubator or small business co-working space, somebody's going on sort of their own sort of mission and they're benefiting from the shared resources or, or mentorship or what have you. Can you talk a little bit about the government's interest in commercialization at energy and sort of sort of tee that up, um, whether it's you all have a mission to purely find innovative solutions cost savings, acquisition sort of uh, strategies. So talk a little bit about the commercialization angle and, and why energy considers that very important in an accelerator model. Um, so one thing to make clear, the Department of Energy procures nothing uh, on the energy side. Um, the, the role of the Office of Energy Efficiency, Renewable Energy and Fossil Energy, uh, we're supporting early stage innovation uh, that would be adopted eventually by the private sector. Um, they, we, the, the expectation is we are uh, funding those critical um, scientific and fundamental gaps in the energy space uh, that um, in five to 10 years we would see as commercial products. Um, where accelerator-like activities and incubator-like activities have been critical is sometimes, so actually I'll talk about three different models that we've, we've traditionally or we, we have historically employed to try to get at the barrier of adoption of technologies by the, by the private sector. Um, the first two we actually did with grant authority, not with prize authority. Um, one is pure grant, one is a blend of grant and prize, and then the third one I'll talk about is pure prize. So the Peer Grant Authority, um, we about seven, eight years ago now, uh, established a business plan competition where we funded universities uh, to train and mentor students who had potential technology applications in the energy sector uh, that they would actually get them through sort of like a lean launchpad methodology approach of go out and talk to your customers and then ultimately culminate in a, a pitch day. And we supported um, prizes uh, at these universities and other partners, but we left the training really up to the partners on the ground. So rather than us prescribing what the actual training module should be or you know, how you prepare these student entrepreneurs for ultimately launching their startups, um, we left it for them to kind of innovate. The next stage of that though is we saw that we would have all these startups then they weren't necessarily figuring out how to navigate the really complicated space of how you find private sector partners and, uh, and funding to actually commercialize your products. Um, so we had launched an incubator initiative where we actually funded uh, innovative and novel programming at accelerators and incubators who we thought were far better at us than us at reaching out to industry uh, and figuring out what they had as their biggest needs and connecting them up with the ultimate startups or solutions that could actually fit those needs. So under that program, we supported new innovative corporate partnership models, um, different accelerator challenges that would say, hey, corporates, what are your big issues? And then they would go out and find the innovation that would actually meet those issues. Um, then the third model that we used was actually building off of a true accelerator model that was our Sunshot Catalyst program where we went from uh, ideation going out to industry saying what are the biggest issues in the solar industry uh, and then it was at first it was a really uh, software focused challenge so we would say if you had a great idea that solved one of those problems with the ideation stage uh, we would give you prototyping support essentially through a top coder coding company 
uh, to our coding crowdsource company, I should say. Uh, and then they would have to rapidly innovate on their prototype and pitch at a demo day where they were then received uh, a stage gated funding of up to $100,000 to continue the innovations in their in their space. Now, the reason why that was, you know, critical for the department is that, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of innovation out there, there's a lot of solvers out there, but we might not necessarily always get to them through grant programs or through, uh, you know, small business uh, grants, uh, especially in a rapidly moving space uh, like uh, solar software. Um, where we see sort of the, the future of using accelerator models um, or uh, supporting prizes to accelerate technology is, you know, how do we, how do we move the speed of uh, how we get some of our early stage technologies into the hand of industry without us necessarily funding all the later stage R&D? Because in order for there to be really customer traction, there needs to be uh, customer adoption and approval of like what those solutions are. So rather than us you know, building out all the different pilot projects, you know, can we actually forge those partnerships through an accelerator model uh, to actually bring in investors, bring in corporates, bring in others who have an interest in an early stage idea and want to carry it forward. Super. Jenna, uh, or a quick follow up. Um, when you mentioned that you were looking at sort of external accelerators or other solution providers, and you just mentioned the word corporate there, quite often in my job when I talk with uh, some corporate leaders and they talk about setting up accelerators or uh, innovation hubs, mm -hmm. I'm finding more so they're looking for external solutions. So there's some very popular ones out there. If you if one reads Entrepreneur Inc. or Forbes magazine, things organizations like Tech Stars, 500 Startups, Y Combinator. Um, if one was, or either tell us about your experience or your recommendations, how do you find these folks out there that have experience running uh, successful or trustworthy accelerators? Did you all just put out a RFP or did you do any type of other due diligence or did you walk the streets to try to find them in major hubs like Boston and New York? Tell us about your experiences. Um, I think it's a combination of all of those things. Uh, so in the, uh, in the example of the, the incubator program, we actually released a solicitation, a competitive solicitation, where it was then peer reviewed and evaluated about what they were proposing to do at their incubator or accelerator. So that's one model. The other part was we were building out a, actually a network of incubators and accelerators to help support entrepreneurs is I traveled the country and met with not just the owners and operators of incubators and accelerators, but talked to the startups and the entrepreneurs being supported by those organizations because you can oftentimes talk to incubators accelerators to say we're the you know best ever we're the greatest incubator or accelerator model you're ever going to find but until i've actually heard from some of the startups or entrepreneurs that have been supported by that organization that they think the same way or talk to an investor who thinks that they are um worthy of being a uh an, an intermediary or a partner uh then i think you should have a heavy dose of skepticism because any good accelerator incubator views their entrepreneurs as their as their most critical element. And if they are not having the outcomes that their entrepreneurs need, then be skeptical. Um, but Techstars is actually interesting because they've actually been taking their their um, their approach and actually uh, what they would call like white labeling it with different corporate partners. But it's because their startups have seen good outcomes. So corporates like to latch onto something that is successful, which I think is good. But in energy, we've, we've kind of joked that there's like, you know, acquisition is R&D, that increasingly uh, energy companies are really looking to acquire earlier stage startups to make themselves more competitive. Super. super. Nancy, um, you talked a bit about your experience with uh, prizes and challenges at uh, DOJ, and you brought that expertise into to NIST. Can you talk about sort of when you, when you came into NIST, sort of what you discovered in terms of their use of challenges and what, um, how you've sort of leveraged your contacts, your expertise, and what's, you know, you're most excited about right now in terms of uh, executing for NIST in this world of accelerators and challenges? Well, the, I guess the biggest, uh, the biggest realization I had, and I thought this was very useful, is to realize that even though you're still working within the government, different agencies work very differently. And um, things like uh, that have been developed, like the uh, the guidelines and all that uh, Tammy's group has put together, are very helpful. They really get you on the right track. 
But then once you get into an agency and you start working with it, you see that each agency operates differently and you have to tailor your approach to starting up a challenge program, starting up an accelerator to fit that agency. Uh, different agencies have different authorities. Uh, you still have to deal with things like human subjects protection, things like uh, Paperwork Production Act, and how does that agency deal with that? That's very important. And part of the process of developing a program is building strong relationships within your own agency. Uh, we have some great legal staff. One of our um, attorneys is here, Doriana, right now. She attends all of these meetings because they're interested and they really want to help develop the program. You really have to reach out to your partners within the agency and also at the same time try to access as many external resources as you can. Um, you were mentioning Techstar and going out, working with different um, independent groups. We work with NASA COSI, who helps us bring in expertise. We're developing a BPO so we can get um, new vendors to work with us and help support us. And we work with challenges and programs internally. So we really try to be as flexible and creative as possible and patient because we are still working within the government entity. So you still have to follow those processes but if you do that and you build strong relationships, you can really uh, break ground that hasn't been broken before. So it is very exciting in that respect. Super. I, I know as I was talking to some friends at uh, Techstars, and I think they were briefing me a little bit about their white label approach, especially with city governments, the city governments, and uh, I suspect soon uh, state governments will look at, uh, again, this model if they're already not in the, uh, the space. Um, speaking of government, Cindy, um, we've talked about a couple sort of commercial interests, commercial sort of approaches. Um, I know you're passionate about sort of your take on the government's involvement in accelerators and our special sort of objectives, not only for public service, but um, do you want to highlight your, your sort of take on that? Any differences on where, again, a corporation might be accelerating or incubating um, innovation for sake of their product line, their future acquisitions and their bottom line versus some of the things that should be motivating us in the public sector and using these models, not only accelerators, but prizes and challenges? Yeah, so it's, as you all know, government is a, is a very unique sort of beast, right? And we have very specific uh, and unique roles in, in sort of the larger innovation ecosystems. Um, and so it's actually important in, in both this project and lots of other projects for us to think about like what it is we're good at and what it is that we're not good at or have is already what already exists and in terms of accelerators i think it's one thing that we realized at least is that there's a pretty healthy ecosystem of like incubators and accelerators across the country right there's there's lots of these uh places that are mostly university based but all over the country that that um are good hubs for this kind of stuff and um the the unique value that at least hhs i think brings into this space in terms of the way we think about these projects is one is money right we bring non-dilutive capital right so like we're not in it for our own personal returns. Um, so that's really important to like seed a field if that's what's necessary. Um, two is that, uh, at least at HHS, we have very specific roles in terms of the, the biomedical and health innovation ecosystem, right? So we have uh, FDA, which regulates market approval of products, and we have the largest payer of, of health products in the world at, at Medicare and CMS. Um, so bringing those guys into the equation is like a unique value that we can bring I mean, lots of agencies have kind of a similar unique sort of component that they bring in. Um, and then third is we obviously have unique subject matter experts um, um, that we bring to this space. And so the way we're designing these accelerators is we don't necessarily want to recreate an accelerator the way industry thinks about it necessarily, but like how do we complement that activity um, and bring in um, what we bring into the equation. Um, so it's more of a partnership model that we're thinking about this. Um, and again, I mean, it, you know, in terms of public versus private interest, right? So um, any place where, you know, there's a larger benefit to bring things into the public domain, I think there's a unique role for government and particularly for HHS in, in this space. Great, thank you. Um, Jen, as a chief of staff, can I ask you uh, your opinion about sort of executive buy-in, executive support, and sort of the necessary components of an accelerator? I know a number of the agencies have sort of pursued this path, but for whatever reason, innovation's never sort of automatic. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about your experience with executive buy-in and support 
of an accelerator at energy? Does the secretary need to sign off on every decision? Was there a big infrastructure built overnight because of executive or is it a constant sort of process of briefing, justifying and showing results? All depends on what you're trying to achieve. I mean, so, and, and what you're trying to launch. Um, for prize authority, the secretary signs off on every prize over a million dollars. So if we're doing a prize over a million dollars, you better make sure it's briefed all the way up because that's the, that is, that's my, my two lovely lawyers who are sitting right here in front of me. Well, well, <laughs> well it says, we need to make sure that's signed off on. Um, but I think what's been interesting is that when you explain the role of um, accelerating the rate of innovation in energy and the different players that are brought in through use of prize authority or different authorities to really engage different actors other than our, our, our grants, um, I think that resonates pretty well with almost any audience, but you just need to be able to clearly articulate how whatever you are trying to develop aligns not just with the mission of the agency, um, but with uh, with the goals and objectives of the of, of the leadership. Um, so, uh, one of the things that we're developing now uh, is. Uh, what we've not only heard is the American Made Challenges uh, Solar Prize. Uh, this was announced that uh, we're, we're going to be launching this uh, later this spring, um, but it it's a concept where we're trying to both bring in industry to identify big issues in making uh, the solar industry competitive in the United States. Um, and leveraging our unique assets of the Department of Energy, the, the national laboratories. So we have these you know, amazing national labs that have scientific and technical expertise that are really unparalleled in the world. And we want to figure out different ways that we can leverage those assets and those capabilities to help support American-based innovation. Um, the way that we're trying to do that is through basically an accelerator model. Uh, and the way that you, that, you know, the, our program managers and somebody like myself sells it is really trying to say, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity for the department. Um, but yeah, whenever you're launching a prize or anything that's new, anything that's different, you need to get buy-in all up and down the chain, or you're going to run into an enormous amount of delays. So that means that you can't just skip over doing briefings with senior officials because it might take a long time to get on someone's calendar. Uh, you need that critical champion and that critical buy-in to actually do something new in in any agency. Thank you, thank you. So um, last sort of open question for, for any of you that want to chime in on this, then I'm going to ask for some audience questions so that your heads up, I'll come to you with the microphone. Um, the speaker right before the break, before we, we started up here, was uh, talking about some of their ROI, their KPIs, their, their metrics in terms of uh, results. Can uh, anybody or all of you talk about um, how you measure success, right? It, it goes from the big 65-inch uh, plasma in the CTO's office with a dashboard, potentially powered by GSA because they do great work on dashboards, uh, to weekly briefings to the, the secretary, um, to team briefings. So how do you um, sort of measure success uh, with an interest towards agency awareness or your key stakeholders, and how does that get executed? Um, if you don't currently do it, is it something in development? So I'll just say quickly, I mean, there there are metrics of success that you can uh, try to capture through data collection information, like um, return on, on uh, investment, follow on funding uh, that went into projects after you've supported them, or number of partnerships, or you know, number of startups that are actually created. But I find that actually those those metrics are are are, are good. Um, what I find are more compelling actually in this space are the stories that you tell about the entrepreneurs themselves that go through these types of programs. So, you know, one of the favorite stories kind of right now inside the building is that there we had a Wave Energy Prize, um, a great prize. It was a stage-gated prototype development prize to develop wave energy conversion technologies. And the ultimate winners out of 92 teams uh, was actually two guys, basically two guys in the garage. Uh, two friends from Oregon State University who developed this prototype that ended up having a five-fold increase over the metrics that we originally set with that we thought was going to be a huge target to hit, they increased it over five-fold. But telling that story about how we incentivized two guys in the garage who beat out like industry people, laboratory people, entrepreneurs all across the country 
through this prize mechanism has been more compelling than me to saying like, and then subsequent to the prize or accelerator, this is how much follow one funding they like achieved. Because I think it's actually the stories that matter just as much as measures of success and, and, and actual metrics and outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. So the, you know, the mission of the Department of Health and Human Services is to promote the, uh, improve the, the health and well-being of all Americans, which is impossible to measure. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, getting further down into it, I, you know, we do measure objective metrics in, in a lot of our projects in terms of, um, uh, yeah, follow-on funding or uh, development of actual products or innovations um, through time. Um, uh, one of the accelerators that we ran last year um, that I actually wasn't really closely involved with, it was sort of mis uh, misspoken a little bit, um, I don't want to take credit for it, uh, was a, an accelerator around uh, develop it, spurring innovation in the development of antibiotics um, called Carbex. Um, and they actually use pretty much one or two metrics to measure their entire project. One is they use um, uh, uh, funding that's leveraged by the private sector because their goal is to stimulate a market, right? And so they're trying to figure out if we put in, you know, 1x, um, you know, how many X can we get back? And I think they've gotten like nine X or something like that in terms of private funding. So, um, so that's one way, you know, it's a clear metric, um, in that case, um, obviously like number of companies and activity and all that kind of stuff. Um, what's kind of interesting. So this is sort of getting to what Jennifer was saying. Um, so HRSA, which there's a crew of three people here, this is our health resources and services administration. Uh, one of the agencies at HHS, um, ran a series of, or ran uh, a multi-phase prize two, two or three years ago uh, called the Word Gap Challenge, um, which is a really an accelerator. Um, we called it a prize, but it's really an accelerator. Um, the, the idea was to, to basically spur innovation or develop products that would help um, address what's known as a 30 million word gap, which is a, a gap in the number and quality of wor uh, words that small children hear uh, between high-income families and low-income families. Um, and so they're trying to invite smart product developers and um, designers and software developers into this space. Um, and it was really interesting hearing the, actually the testimonials from the folks that went through this because they, they were really excited about this because it provided a Silicon Valley-like structure to a field that has nothing resembling that. Um, and so just hearing those kinds of stories, I think, was a really important metric for success in terms of the program within HHS. Nancy, uh, tell us a little bit uh, again about sort of how you all measure the outcomes and also want to add on, do you all report them um, to Congress? Do they, do they go into official documentation? I'm just going to add that element onto yours and then we're going to do a, a speed round of Q&A because we're, we're just going to catch up in terms of the overall event timeline. Okay. Um, well, we, uh, like everyone else, we, uh, we try to capture the standard measures, the stand standard metrics. One of the things we're trying to do is incorporate uh, the metrics that are gathered through challenge.gov to make it that much easier for us so we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, just gather those um, automatically. Um, what is harder to capture, and I think this is what's been discussed, is some of the intangibles. Like, uh, for instance, when we have our annual stakeholders meeting and uh, the winners of our last prize got together, uh, they started making great networks and uh, were planning on their next projects that they were going to work on together. So those kinds of partnerships are a little more difficult to measure. So one of the things that we're doing, and this gets into congressional reporting, is uh, we are going to uh, make sure that we have an external evaluator because um, we need to focus on developing and implementing the accelerator. Uh, we want experts to come in and evaluate us. That will uh, allow us to stay honest to our mission, which I think we would anyway, obviously. But also, when it comes time to report to Congress and report externally, there's a lot more validity if you have an external evaluator. So we do do, uh, we do do our internal evaluations. Before the accelerator was even developed, uh, the uh, PSCR staff worked with their stakeholders to develop roadmaps for research and development. So they could identify where does the technology need to go in different focus areas, where is it now, and what are the gaps? So by looking at that and seeing how have we closed those gaps, that's gonna give us some estimate. And we have our internal metrics, but an external evaluator really gives us something that's much more objective and um, should carry probably a little more weight with uh, those externally. 
Awesome. Any audience questions uh, real quick? We've got a few more minutes with our panelists. Um, say your name, please. And look. Thank you. Um, I'm Dan Bader. And uh, my question is uh, for all the panel. Um, and so I, I work on challenges uh, at the EPA. Um, and I uh, have really found a lot of value in the cross agency collaborations that we've formed in some of our challenges. And I was uh, wondering, to, uh, I wanted to hear from you guys, like your uh, some of your experiences working with other agencies, or maybe some challenges uh, in working with other agencies. Well, so we've collaborated with you guys. We've had great relationships with with EPA. Um, the obvious benefits are that uh, there's lots of overlap in what agencies do, and there's a lot of complementarity and opportunities for amplification. Um, so, like finding that balance is. Um, you know, once it's found, the, like for example, with EPA, I mean, there's a huge, there's obviously overlap between what HS does and what EPA does, and there's like different assets we bring. Um, you know, we, we ran this challenge together to um, develop better uh, technology to measure toxicity and, and um, the way we do that uh, through like regulatory means. Um, again, sort of complementary there. The, the challenge, um, you know, and we look for collaborations across the field in anything we do. The challenge is always bureaucracy. <laughs> Um, uh, sometimes it's just not worth the extra effort to like do something together and deal with like the, you know, different rules and regulations and different agencies, different approval processes. Um, just the fact that you have when you have more collaborators, it just takes more time to like get through a project. So finding that balance is always important. But we, I think, about fifty percent of our challenges we've done with some other agency or some other partner in some way. I, I would say that the to the extent you can collaborate, that's always great. Um, one of the most valuable things that we do is try to informally work with other agencies who do similar work to make sure that we're not stepping on toes, doing overlap, that we're using the government's money most efficiently so that we're either working together or we have separate areas that we're working on. Um, and I think you know that's hard to do because the government's so complex. But to the extent that that can be done, we always try to do that. Any other uh, questions? I get paid if I end on time, so that's my, my goal here. Um, we have one more question. Um, Carrie Whitford, Bureau of Reclamation. I actually don't have a question. I have just a comment, but our um, leadership is definitely putting a greater focus on return on investment for research, which prizes and challenges are falling under. So this year we did have to do an ROI calculation of all the competitions that we've run and actually give um, a benefit cost ratio number. So what we're doing is we're trying to put a value on every solution that we received as if we had to pay for it. Because had we gone out with, you know, we've gotten, you know, thousands of solutions coming in. Had we gone out and bought even that idea, it would have cost a certain amount. And so then we put another value on those winning solutions. And so our leadership has been very receptive to that. Obviously, once we get prototypes in place and working, that's going to have a whole nother value once it's implemented. But we're putting even a value on just the solutions that we received because we would have had to pay researchers to get those solutions. So not yet. We're just doing briefings literally this week. It's like hot off the press, but we are getting a lot of scrutiny, not just on prize competitions, but on research in general. Like, you know, what have you bought for me? Because it seems sometimes, I think to some people, because a lot of these projects are long term, that it, money goes into a hole and they don't see a benefit. And so we're really having to try to prove that benefit. So that, is that a financial ROI that you have to report? That's right. Yes. Great. So uh, one minute each. Um, any uh, any uh, other programs beyond your own that you're a big fan of that you encourage the audience to sort of check out? Might be a peer agency, a uh, dear friend that you sort of uh, compare notes with here and or add on what's the future of accelerators and prizes within the next uh, couple of years. Jen, if you can start us off again, any any referrals or recommendations on federal colleagues you really impressed with their work and what do you see as it coming around the corner in this space? Hmm. Uh, that's a hard question because I actually think that this community is one of the most innovative, forward-thinking communities in the federal government. Um, I have relied a lot on the expertise of others uh, to um, further my understanding of how prizes and challenges operate, further my understanding of how internal accelerators can work, um, and what we can do to think creatively. Um, I mean, Kelly and Tammy uh, are phenomenal assets here at GSA and are just incredible repositories of information and 
if you ever need like any, of course, sorry guys, if you ever need any like recommendations, especially who to connect with other agencies, GSA is actually a re really great single point of contact. I mean, Sandeep's work in HHS is unbelievable. Um, and another colleague over at uh, NASA, Jen Gassett at QSB over at OSCP is also just like a brain trust uh, in, uh, in our industry. But uh, I find that with this community, just ask for help, just reach out and people are gonna help you no matter what you're trying to create and solve. Cool. Sandeep, final tips for the audience? Yeah, this is an awesome community. By the way, I'm a big fan of what DOD, DOE is doing and what NIST is doing. So happy to, yeah. Um, I always look to, to both of them for, for inspiration. Um, uh, I, I just want to note that I, I, we, this is sort of a community question. Um, we always talk about these tools as sort of discrete things. You know, we talk about prizes, we talk about crowdsourcing, we talk about accelerators. I think they're all um, flavors of the same essence. Um, and even though they rely, may rely on different authorities and you know, by agency, I think we have to, I, I, what I see the future being is like somehow like we have a strategy and a framework that puts it all together into one kind of bucket and, and sort of, um, so, so I, I sort of see them evolving in different ways and combining and you know, diverging and you know, it'll be interesting to see the evolution in the next few years. Nancy? Um, I guess my, my biggest tip would be to, if you aren't already, get on the listserv that uh, Tammy's office runs. Um, it is for the challenge group. It is such a great resource, um, as both groups were saying. This is a really, really helpful community. It's a very knowledgeable community and a very sharing community. Um, so often I'll be struggling with something and I'll think, you know, how am I going to tackle that? And then it's like, oh my gosh, just, you know, look at the listserv, see what the answers are there. And you'll find that it doesn't, it's not one size fits all. It's like, sometimes you'll look at it and say, oh my gosh, your agency lets you do that. Or, you know, your agency makes you do that. Um, so it's, it's different. <laughs> there's a lot of that, but, um, there's a, a network that's really been built, um, in this, in this area and is growing. So, um, just know that you can reach out to those people and remember to tap into those resources. That would be, you know, what I would suggest. Yeah. My final show in the, in the world of uh, small business and entrepreneurship, I read a study and these are key words that entrepreneurs and co-working and incubator space would tell for a very large uh, membership organization. The reason they inv involve themselves in innovation communities like the one we have here with the federal government, keywords would be friendly, creative, social, collaborative, inspiring, and flexible. I think those are all the things that we're trying to continue here as a community. And I know I've chatted with some colleagues, which I just, people I steal ideas from and try to implement myself. How do we access toolkits that sort of learn from folks that are a little bit down a particular path than we are, share what we have to offer and stay uh, active. So thank you to Kelly and Tammy and the GSA team. Pulling off events like this is not easy. They do a great job of it. Uh, they pull us together and they're the glue that help uh, the government's innovation agenda continue. Uh, thank you for joining us and a round of applause for our panelists. for our moderator. All right, well, thank you so much. I think that we all found that um, panel discussion to be very enlightening and we really appreciate the, the energy and enthusiasm of our panelists. We will be inviting you back again. Um, so next up, I want to invite a, a team from USAID who shows passion and enthusiasm for what they do every day as well. And, and they're going to be talking uh, specifically about a humanitarian effort um, that, is, that is just about ready to kick off. I believe they are just back from travel too, which is just great that they could make it here today. So I'm going to welcome up Lauren Kavanaugh-Alku and Devorah West. And as they're coming up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them.
Um, so Lauren is the Senior Advisor for Grand Challenges for Development um, at the U.S. Global Development Lab at USAID, which has long been a, a power user of, of prizes. She serves as a liaison across um, AIDS 10 Grand Challenge programs, sharing best practices and learnings across programs, coordinating around partner engagement, generating awareness and support for existing programs and innovations, and helping to launch new grand challenges. And Devorah is the private sector engagement advisor for the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is also within USAID. She manages strategic engagement with the private sector and humanitarian assistance and disaster response activities, including through the Creating Hope in Conflict Humanitarian Grand Challenge. We are very happy to have you here today. Yay, welcome. Great. Hi, I'm Lauren Kavanaugh Yuku, um, and that's a very old picture. I'm feeling a little bit embarrassed about it. Time to update the headshot. Um, but as Tammy mentioned, I do work across the agency with our teams that are leading Grand Challenge programs. The way we define our Grand Challenge programs are they are public private platforms. Plat uh, sorry, public-private partnership platforms where we're bringing together different donors and investors who are interesting in helping us solve a core and critical development challenge that we've not been able to um, address on our own. So we're trying to bring in new solutions, identify new solutions, pilot them, and start scaling them up. We deploy a lot of these different resources that we just heard about. We not only fund innovation, but we do spend a lot of time and effort working on providing technical assistance, advisory support. Um, we work on the acceleration angle, bringing in lots of advisors who can help our innovators really achieve success and get to impact faster. Um, so we are super excited that we are now able to announce our 10th Grand Challenge, which Devorah West is going to give you some more details around it. Um, we're looking for additional partners and would love also to help uh, have your support in helping us spread the word around this opportunity. So as Lauren mentioned, um, I work in our U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Uh, so we're kind of the office that's in charge of a lot of our humanitarian assistance programming and disaster response activities. Um, so while kind of innovation and private sector engagement um, is not new to USAID, it, it's been kind of quite done frequently on the development side of the house. Um, there sometimes can be kind of a, a bit of a gulf between some of our development programs and our humanitarian assistance programs. Um, so engaging the private sector and embracing innovation certainly kind of has happened at the local level um, in terms of our humanitarian activities, but nothing, um, it hasn't really been done strategically, particularly proactively. Um, and the kind of the, the needs facing the humanitarian uh, kind of sector writ large are just unprecedented um, today. And um, so um, kind of when you look at kind of the overarching humanitarian um, system, there are about 136 million people around the world who are living in humanitarian crisis. Um, less than one percent of kind of um, humanitarian assistance fund humanitarian assistance funding is spent on innovation. Um, there's a really big need, really big gap. Um, traditional donors are um, the kind of the needs are just outpacing the ability of traditional donors to respond. So. The office I sit in has been kind of t tasked with engaging, again, the private sector a little bit more uh, strategically and um, proactively in what we're doing, but we're also um, quite interested in doing this within kind of the grand, the grand challenge uh, model. Um, so we uh, kind of recognize that we need new solutions, um, new ideas, new ways of tackling kind of these, these huge, huge problems. So we, um, We've teamed up with uh, the UK's the Department for International Development and Grand Challenges Canada and have launched this Grand Challenge. It's a five-year, um, before I go on to that, it's, it's a five-year program, it's $15 million. Um, and the kind of the main kind of solution that we've we've developed or kind of we're really looking to, to drive here is again, kind of engaging the private sector at kind of a, um, at a strategic level to help with kind of that commercialization aspect, but also certainly tapping into the private sector 
local kind of private sector ingenuity and creativity um, to really help develop and um, scale up uh, new solutions. At the heart of this, we really, um, we recognize that the people who are affected by um, conflict are really need to remain at the heart and center of this. So we really want their needs and um, kind of their, um, that, that context to really be driving the solutions that are created. Um, ultimately, we really want to identify solutions um, that allow communities themselves to kind of more nimbly respond um, and be able to, um, yeah, kind of more nimbly respond to the crises that they're facing. And one really key important thing that I completely left out at the beginning is um, we've we've noticed more and more in our humanitarian um, response activities that there are there are communities, there are vulnerable people, there are um, certain areas that are just incredibly hard to reach, and it's really hard to access those communities, get aid to those communities, again, particularly in conflict. Um, at USAID, we spend about 80% of our budget on those big humanitarian um, kind of conflict settings. Um, so that's kind of a big framing piece I left out at the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, so um, this is our kind of first call for innovations. We launched it just last week in London. Um, it is, we seek life-saving or life-improving innovations to help the most vulnerable and hardest reach people impacted by humanitarian crises caused by conflict. Um, again, we're really interested in innovations that engage the private sector, that draw from affected um, communities, and that kind of look to one or more of these um, particular areas in order to provide supply or locally generate clean water and sanitation energy, life-saving information, or health supplies and services. So the, this first call is open for um, eight weeks. It closes on April 12th. Um, again, these are, mind the typo, but these are um, the four kind of key focus areas. These were developed through kind of a rigorous um, academic exercise that Grand Challenges Canada actually led um, in kind of developing what are kind of the really big problems facing the humanitarian community that are facing, or that affected communities face. Um, we then also kind of took that list and then further refined it through conversations, through a lot of interviews, outreach with um, humanitarians, with affected community members, um, and kind of came up with this, this, this core list. Um, we're, we're really quite open in terms of the types of solutions we're looking to uh, receive. Um, but just kind of for example, you know, if you take kind of around health services and products, you know, just imagine being in a conflict zone and you have a chronic illness, you know, you don't even need to necessarily have been wounded in something, but you maybe have a chronic illness and it's impossible to get kind of um, medicine delivered or, you know, from the humanitarian perspective, a lot of medicine, it's, it's hard to get through different blockades. It's also um, it often um, uh, products can fall into the wrong hands. So just kind of thinking through if we can reimagine how uh, health products and services might be delivered, if there's a way to maybe repurpose or re-sterilize materials, or if there's a way to kind of more locally manufacture or generate the kind of um, services or products you need that could really kind of revolutionize how we, how we provide healthcare um, in conflict settings. So this is a little bit more about the awards. Um, as I mentioned, it's a five-year program, $15 million. Uh, we've got funding at the seed level, um, and we're kind of expecting to award 10 to 15 um, at this level, um, up to about 250 Canadian dollars. It's in Canadian dollars because Grand Challenges Canada is implementing this program, so it's going out in Canadian dollars. Um, and then we also have funding for transition to scale, so these are kind of a little later stage. Um, innovations and kind of the focus of transition to scale is really on that kind of testing refinement um, uh, of, of solutions that kind of have already achieved proof of concept. Um, we, as I said, we've just opened up the first call this past week um, and that's accepting um, applications at the seed funding level and then also kind of letters of, uh, letters of intent for the transition to scale funding. Um, 
we will also issue another round at the, uh, we'll issue another call in a year's time. Uh, we're also looking to provide additional support. So this, so this, these awards are going out as grants. Um, we're looking to kind of provide additional support through kind of acceleration, acceleration support, mentorship, networking. Um, a key piece of the transition to scale is having actually a private sector match. Um, so one of the pieces we're kind of building into this is helping um, applicants who may not have that match or may need to kind of um, I want to say kind of create a more robust match where you know we're we're very open and expecting to play a role kind of in, in providing that um and that's it and again i i think as lauren as lauren mentioned you know we're really interested in, in getting the word out about this um it's it's very new for our office so we're drawing on a lot of lessons um from kind of our development colleagues um and you know certainly interested in in kind of collaborating where and with who it makes sense. Um, but certainly if there's interested, if there's interest in the room, you know, would, would definitely be happy to talk about it further. That's it. Great. So I think we have a couple of min minutes for some questions and answers. Yeah. If anyone has anything they'd like to put to Lauren or Deborah, anyone? Curious broadly, uh, USAID, what's the process uh, by which you identify grand challenges? Um, so as Devora mentioned, we actually go through a fairly rigorous process where we're working with technical experts, we're working with industry experts, we work with even affected communities in this case, where we help to rework and identify what is the key challenge that we could be working on with other donors and investors to address. So it usually takes quite a while, there's a lot of research behind it. We do market um, gap identification to understand where there might be solutions, but maybe they're not getting to the right users for a key reason. We try to understand what those barriers are. Um, we try to understand which solvers might want to respond to a call like this in advance. We do, it usually takes us quite a long while. This process probably took about a year and a half all said um, to come up with this challenge statement um, and identify the core areas that we're going to be focusing on. So that, that's downscaling after you already identified the challenge. So it's just crafting your statement and finding focus areas. Mm -hmm. Just more broadly, if this is your 10th grand challenge, how mm -hmm. do you come up with the grand challenges? Uh, and, and, and you do understand there's yeah. a diverse set of actors. I'm just curious about the how. Um, so typically, we go through a process of um, we work with our innovation design team um, that actually can help identify where there might be an area where it's a really useful spot for us to consider a grand challenge approach. Um, our innovation design team will uh, run through workshops with teams to they know they have a key issue. They can address it through traditional approaches. They've tried everything. Um, we will run through all the different option program options. We'll do workshops to identify whether a challenge approach is the right fit for that. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that approach, I'd be happy to connect you with our innovation design advisory services team that has like a, a process and toolkits behind that um, identification. I would also maybe just add, I mean, certainly from kind of within our office, it was, um, it was quite an organic process. Um, it was a tool we knew that the kind of agency or a process that the agency had. Um, and we had kind of leadership buy-in and, and interest in doing something like this, partly because they are, um, they are really useful platforms, not just for kind of driving innovation and giving grants, but for kind of, um, I think also shining a spotlight on kind of really critical issues that are underfunded. Um, so it kind of, I think Lauren and her team had already done some work around kind of some of the needs in the humanitarian space. And I think we're kind of pondering and thinking through doing a challenge in, in kind of the humanitarian sector and kind of simultaneously, we were kind of thinking about it and it kind of, I want to say, you know, it, it um, we were able to like meld minds and organically kind of create this timing worked well. Can you all talk a little bit about the legal authority that you use or legal authorities that you might use to run your prize competitions? Uh, 
so our prize competitions are under the prize authority. So it's a very different uh, mechanism than what we would have to use for a challenge fund. Um, so for the challenge fund, we simply put out an RFP or, or an RFA. In this case, we're using an implementing partner that's putting out the procurement call. But um, the prize authority, I, while grand challenges can be a platform for a prize, I, um, I would have to go to our legal department to ask more about you know, how we were going to run this with them. So I, I feel, unfortunately, ill-equipped to talk more about the prize authority. Yeah. And we have a, so we have a cooperative agreement with Grand Challenges Canada. And then, as Lauren said, Grand Challenges Canada is the one who actually issued the RFA, or the RFP. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Devora. Thank you. All right, well, again, I wanna thank everybody for taking time out of their really busy schedules to come uh, today. And I hope that you found the information and insights shared useful. We encourage you to stay and continue networking with some of your colleagues. We do have this space for some time. So please stay, introduce yourselves to the folks sitting next to you. Um, I do wanna give you an early heads up, um, save the date. We're looking at May 18th as the next date for our quarterly community of practice meeting and hope that you all will be able to attend again in person. Um, and uh, please, if, if we've not previously met with you, please grab a member of the uh, challenge.gov program team or uh, the GSA staff. We'd love to meet you. Thank you again. Thank you to all of our speakers. You all were incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs>